It's a little bit of a long question. Um, my very fit uh, and active husband had a cardiac arrest in 2015. He has a gene fault to do with the ryanodyne receptor, but it's not conclusive that it's the cause due to limited research today. They're working with a specialist in Manchester. His mum has since been found to have a fast heart rhythms, uh, 137 resting heart rate, and bradycardia. My husband's resting rate is 40 BPM, but his DFib download shown in the last six months is a, has had 100 fast VF, which has been paced out of. Could the combination of the gene fault on his dead side and these fast rhythms from his mum be what caused it, and I'm assuming the cardiac arrest? Mm -hmm. I've got to, again, hold my hand up and say I don't honestly know what a rhinodin receptor is. And I think, to be fair, if you're under a specialist in Manchester, and Manchester is an incredibly good heart centre, yeah. I think I would ask them this question because they will have heard of the receptor because by definition yeah. that's why they did the test. Uh, I, I think the honest answer is I think anything is possible. I think we don't understand these things as well as we need to. And I think only by doing genetics, MRI, imaging, better, better everything and research can we possibly understand what's going on in the future and make our care better? So I'm sorry to be sort of generic on the response, but I think it's unfair to do anything more specific. Mm. There, there, there's some limited studies out there that potentially suggest that ultra-endurance athletes can, can damage their heart. I've only seen it in like the ultra-endurance athletes, though. You know, you're a marathon runner, wasn't it? Yes, this, this person yeah. did do marathons. I, I don't think... Unless he was running marathons each week, it's probably unlikely to be the cause. Of I, but I previously ran over ten marathons as well before my cardiac arrest. So. Yeah, no, I don't think that the, you know you'd have to be doing some significant mileage to. No, I was to, never to, doing that to cause an issue. I think personally. Okay, um, probably the last couple. I have two children who have had a sudden cardiac arrest and genetic testing positive for TRND on this RYR2. Now, both suffer problems with going to the toilet and taking movie coal and are much slower than other children such as running, jumping, etc. I've read this could be related to skeletal muscle issues. Should I get this looked into further? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think there's two components to this for me. I think that, you know, we know that certain genetic defects don't just affect one thing. They may be... We, they have an effect on one thing that we notice, but actually, as you rightly say, if it does have an effect on skeletal muscle uh, and muscle in more, uh, a more general way, then I think it's inevitable that it will affect potentially the physical ability of the children. The second thing to say is that if you have got a, uh, a child who's had a cardiac arrest, then they are going to have all of the sequelae and the problems potentially that an adult cardiac arrest sufferer will have, you know, which is the tiredness, the exhaustion, you know, and all those recovering and recuperation issues uh, from potentially a small brain injury that, that, that adults would have. So I think absolutely yes. And again, I think you know, it sounds like you're on the, the, the way to getting a more definitive genetic diagnosis. But I, these are exactly the questions you need to be asking your geneticist and your sort of paediatric and genetic cardiologist because I think they are, or they, sh they should be, in a much better place to answer that question. But sadly, even they may struggle because lots of things are very rare, and it's only when we've got you know, more genes from more patients that we can start putting the picture together. So I think you, for your own uh, interest, I think it would be reasonable to pursue it further. It may require a muscle biopsy uh, to try and put everything together, but, and that's something you can decide whether that's worthwhile. But I, I would ask the question and, and see what happens. Okay, um, this uh, question relates to uh, uh, a baby in this rather sad case and I did, I did talk with James and uh, Tom prior to this webinar and I, I don't, uh, don't know if you want to just add, add a few words about how it may be best for a paediatric... Um... Yes, so I think it was a very, a very young child, 15 months, who had a rare pneumonic type disease of their lungs and the baby also had had some open surgery at four days, and the question was, you know, have we seen something like this before? And again, sorry to, to sort of pass the buck, but I think it's only fair to say that we are both adult cardiac specialists, and to comment on things well outside of our expertise is, is in my view, unhelpful. And I think that, um, unfortunately, this, this case would be best discussed with the relative paediatrician in, in the current light of day, because I think that 
when you have a terrible instant, be it a cardiac arrest or be it a, a baby who's, who's, who's passed away, I think a lot of the questions come up some time after the event. And, and, and so I think it would be worthwhile reconnecting with the, the experts and, and, and the people you dealt with at the time and coming back with these questions to help you sort of grieve and to come through the process would be my opinion. Yeah. But I'm afraid we're not the right people. Okay. And the last question for tonight, um, I'll, I'll paraphrase because it's quite a long question. Um, it, this person had a, 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 no diagnosis of their cardiac arrest and at the time they were helping to carry a large object. Um, and they'd seen a recent study which says there are five main causes for cardiac arrest and one of those can be uh, when there is an imbalance of potassium and magnesium in the body when it is under duress, uh, causing uh, problems with electrical flow. Um, the question is really how long does it take for the, the, the chemicals to return to normal levels if there is an imbalance and um, how can that be detected and bearing in mind the amount of time that the CPR was done on this person and then for the time they actually took to get to hospital, would it actually be determinable? Um, a blood test requested by a GP a few months ago, a few months ago found these levels to be normal. Uh, I guess he's just trying to find a reason. And to me, I've, I've read lots about potassium and magnesium, yeah. uh, eating bananas and all that sort of thing daily. I don't do that, but is that something that cardiac arrest survivors should do? Uh, I don't think so. I think cardiac arrest survivors, uh, unless you had a cardiac arrest because your potassium was really low, which this person describes it wasn't because it was checked some months earlier. So I think what we know is, and we see one maybe every month, every two months, we see people with a very low potassium. So normal potassium is between three and a half and five. And when it causes cardiac arrest, it will be less than two. It's 1.7, it's 1.8, it's terribly, terribly low. So it's not just subtly low, it's terribly low. And it's almost invariably linked to drugs. So uh, benzodiazepine and water tablets can completely deplete your body of potassium. And this does not occur overnight. Or uh, the other person, the cohort I've seen it in is young bulimic patients who eat food and then throw up and, and then don't keep their food down. And again, their electrolytes go all over the shop. So I think it is a very legitimate and real cause of cardiac arrest. In patients with, uh, who have a heart attack and then have a heart cardiac arrest, it may be they have lower magnesium levels and slightly lower potassium levels that makes them a little more electrically likely to go into a, a nasty arrhythmia. But I think that if it's the sole cause, you will find out because when you come to hospital, it will be really low. It won't be subtly low, it will be really low. So is it the cause of, of your cardiac arrest? I think very unlikely because you would have picked it up when you got to the hospital. That would be my view. But I think like all these things, it's the sum of the small parts. So why does someone with a blocked artery have a cardiac arrest and the next person come along? Not. It's lots and lots of things. Some we understand, some we don't. Individual, isn't it? Okay, I think that pretty much just about concludes all the questions. We haven't had too many come in and we've answered most of the ones that have uh, um, as we've gone along. So I'd just like to finish off with a couple of things about um, the Southern Cardiac Arrest Group. So I don't know if you've seen the leaflet and the leaflet that was uh, advertised in the group. We've got quite a few of these to distribute to any hospitals that uh, you happen to be going to. Just drop SADS. Um, a cardiac hospital, it's not just any old hospital. <laughs> um, drop the SADS uh, an email and tell them where you want them for um, and they'll send them out to you. It'd be really helpful if you could get them to other people like yourselves. Um, the other thing is this Saturday we've got our uh, annual meetup in the Mulberry Bush pub in London. Uh, still a few tickets um, but it's pretty much uh, packed out so if you want any I would advise you to get them tonight. And T-shirts um, still available. Any profits from that will go to SADS as well. And finally, just to say a massive thank you for uh, coming and talking to us for well over two hours now. Um, Dr. Tom Keeble and uh, James Young, Chief Cardiac Scientist from both from Basildon Hospital, Essex Cardiac Thoracic Centre. It's a pleasure. Thanks very much. Thanks for having us. No worries. And we'll say good night now. Good night.